Just for the record, I'm, I'm French, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do it in French tonight. I'm just going to do it in English. Is that okay? The thing, though, is that if you have questions, um, this, is, this is meant to be a dialogue, okay? So if you have questions, raise your hand, or we can have a conversation at the end. English, then. <laughs> and you may, of course, of course. Well, thanks a lot for inviting us. Um, how many of you know design thinking? <laughs> okay. Well, we're done then. <laughs> well, I hope I'm going to be able to bring uh, some information, some additional information coming from, from Silicon Valley. As, uh, as Heidi mentioned, I think what we want to do is general intro of IDEO and then think about startups and how we work with startups. So the notion of designing business at IDEO, because let's first look at who we are as a whole. General information. IDEO generates business impact through a human-centered innovation process. Now, you're going to hear tonight a lot of things about human-centered design because this is our process, but this is also the way we behave as a company. Culturally, we are a human-centered company, meaning that everybody at IDEO matters. We built our company around people, our assets, our main asset is people. David Kelly, I wanted to create a company to work with my friends. That was 30 years ago. David Kelly, the founder of IDEO, I was like, you know what? I work for these big corporations. I'm tired of this. I just want to open a company and have fun working with my friends. That was it. There was nothing else. So that's purely Silicon Valley. But what's interesting is to notice is that even 30 years later, this is still the case. We still want to work with friends. So that DNA, that very simple quote, is still very much valid right now. And it's very important because that has repercussions throughout everything we do. So over the years, we've worked on, launched more than 5,000 products, services, new businesses, spaces, and so on and so forth. This is just a, a short snapshot of this. So, and we are a global creative network. We have uh, offices, you see the black dots, that's where we are, we're global. We have about 500, 530 people. So it's still a, a small company, relatively speaking, <laughs> compared even to your school, right? <laughs> but um, 500 people globally, offices in London and, uh, and Munich in, in Europe, and then Chicago, Boston, New York, San Francisco, Palo Alto, and Asia, Boston, uh, yeah, in Boston is on Asia, uh, Tokyo, uh, Singapore, Mumbai, and Shanghai. And the way we work is mo very much multidisciplinary. That, that was one of, of, of the, the question that you raised, Manuel, which is the fact that being multidisciplinary in design and in innovation in general is absolutely fundamental. Um, so we started as a company, as a product development company. We had engineers, we had uh, industrial designers, and then we started to grow organically. Um, now we have communication designers, we have architects, we have brand strategists, we have business designers now. And I'll talk more about this. We have web developers, researcher, material scientists. We, uh, we hire, um, recently we've hired a 
uh, synthetic biologist and, and a food scientist. Because that's the way innovation grows. When we see a potential, when we see something interesting, we say, well, let's just hire this person. And then um, we'll see what, what will happen. So either these people come as, a, as residents to start with us, or we hire them and we create a market around that. And that's this organic nature of IDEO that makes us where we are today. It was not planned at the beginning, but we see things evolve. So the permeability, the ability to understand what's out there combined with a vision is what create companies like IDEO. Uh, by the way, if I go too fast, you can slow me down or I can explain things in French if that's okay with you guys. We're deeply collaborative, so that's another factor, okay? So 30 years ago, companies would come to IDEO and say, hey, here's a brief, redesign this. Put it on the table, they come back three months later, oh, there you go, da-da. Well, that was great 30 years ago. That cannot no longer happen. Why? Because the challenges that companies face are far more complicated and complex than they were 30 years ago. So when we say we're deeply collaborative, it's just because our clients know their business, right? More than we do. And by doing it together, we get faster results and more impact. What that means is that when we start a project, at the very beginning, the kickoff, we just collaborate. That's it. There's no formalities around this. It's like, okay, let's just get into it. Let's understand what you want of this project. Let's understand what we want. And how are we going to get there? So pro understand who you are. Understand what is your challenge. Understand what is the process you want to get through to get there. And obviously, what is the impact that you want to have. And oh, by the way, the roles that you want to have. So clarification at the very beginning of a project is really, really, really important with, with clients. It is not about a dance, you know, I mean, the dance is, yeah, can happen, but, it, but it's just getting to know each other really quickly, building trust. And for those of you who've been working in the consulting environment, building trust with your clients is absolutely fundamental. And you want to do that really quickly. Because if you don't do it, then at some point the project might take a path and then lead somewhere else. So honesty and trust at a very early stage. We work with multiple industries that uh, you probably know. Here are some of our clients. Now, what's interesting about this in the world of innovation is that more and more of our clients want us to what we call cross-fertilize, meaning that we have designers who are very generalists. Okay, When they work on a project, they're going to work then their next project is going to be with a different industry and they're going to be able to leverage the knowledge that they've acquired to cross-fertilize with a different industry. So that's from a process, internal process perspective. Now, from our clients, we also see that they want that. So they call us and say, we want to do this project with you, but we'd like to partner with a different industry. Who are the clients you want us to work, you know, we could work together. So our role is also to generate and to create these conversations with our clients. And that happens more and more. Why? Because innovation does not happen in a vacuum, right? Innovation is not a linear path, and you'll see, hopefully you'll see that today with design thinking. A lot of companies think about innovation and a, as a very linear. I'm going to point A to point B to point C. It's very structured. It's very Cartesian. And what we realize, it's just clearly not the case for us. Innovation is not linear. Breakthrough innovation just does, you know, happens sometimes and like it comes out of the blue, and that's okay. I'll come back to that point because that's an important one. So what are the ways that we help our clients grow? Aha, <laughs> design thinking. Well, you've probably seen this one. But um, we've, we've validated that framework over and over. And this kind of works well for us. So if you think about the innovation at the inter intersection of these three circles, there's three essential components. People, what we call desirability, Business, viability, and technical aspect. Well, the thing is, many companies in Silicon Valley and elsewhere do what we call tech push. Tech push. They have a technology and they're going to push it to market. They're going to say, hey, that's great. You're going to love it. You know, let's do it. Well, what we advise to do is to do tech pull, meaning that you first start by understanding people's desire, needs and desire. That's where you start. And once you have that, 
you integrate the other facets. You integrate the technology and the business. Now, of course, this is very schematic, and this is very generic in nature, because that circle, I mean, this, this three circles, that diagram, that framework, is actually very dynamic. It doesn't really, you know, it, you, it can, you can go at any point. What really matters is taking all these three facets into consideration at the very beginning of the project, okay? There's so many companies who fail because they didn't take into consideration either the, what we call the human factor. The business, business and technology at some point works, right? The human being sometimes like, ah, yeah, it's gonna work, you know? So that's where we start. That's what design thinking is. Now, for you all to know is design thinking is a basic process. That's what we start. It doesn't stay in the clouds because that's not what we're about. We're about creating impact. So really, what we're in the business of design making, right? And what I mean by that is that design making is starting with an idea, idea and start prototyping really, really, really quickly. Prototyping and rapid prototyping is the fundamental key to everything we do at IDEO, right? So this is an example of a surgical tool. We were at the first meeting with a client. That was all great. We discussed opportunities, blah, blah, blah. And the client said, hey, you know, that was a, a nasal surgery tool. And he said, oh, I think I have an idea. OK, great. It takes a few things together. Assemble it. Put it on the table. That's it. Well, okay, well, that's it. That's great. Well, yeah, it was it, <laughs> really. Because what we did, it was the right idea. And what we did for the rest of the project was prototyping, validating, prototyping, validating, prototyping, validating. And that's the process that you see here. Very rough to market. So I'm going to come back to this very notion of prototyping because that's an important one. Many companies, when they think about innovation, again, they think about, hey, well, we have a budget for innovation. That's great. Let's spend it. Let's incubate it for many months, weeks, months, maybe years. Very cerebral activities, and they're great. Huh? They lay out the whole plan. They don't do any, any uh, particular prototyping. And then, well, now finally, they're ready. Yeah, we can, uh, we can prototype. We can do something real scale. Well, the issue with this is that, yes, they're going to invest a lot of money on the prototyping. Uh, but if it doesn't work, that's a problem. Because they've invested a lot of money, and now they're going to have to redo it again. So what we say, what we advocate and, and, and advise our, our, our clients to do is say, well, start small. Even if it's you're a small startup or a large company, start small with what you have right here on the table. If it's a piece of paper, start with a piece of paper. Do it. Show it to people, potential customers, users, investors, and then start refining from there. That's the process of refinement. It's like a sculpture, right? A sculpture, you never start a sculpture with the finesse, with the small details. I mean, it's a no-brainer, really, right? You start with a big picture, and then you refine, you refine, 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 until you get it right. Design making, yes. So we gather insights to question deep-seated market assumption. I'm going to show you several projects here to illustrate that particular point. Uh, Air New Zealand. Do you know Air New Zealand? It's, it's a large carrier company and they, uh, they ask us to redesign the long haul experience. I would say, okay, that, that, that's really interesting, right? Except that if you have worked in this industry, you know that it's virtually impossible to change anything because it's completely regulated. Air New Zealand was great because they, they came to us with a very clear brief, do whatever you want. Well, by the way, this, this is the type of brief that we really love, right? Here is a white card, go for it. Now the thing is that what you have to know about IDEO is that we have, we're very privileged. Because even if a company comes to us with a very defined brief, we're gonna look at it and we're gonna say, mm, it might be a good idea to actually reframe the brief. Because that's what design is, right? Designers look at the brief, if they feel this is the right brief, they do it. If it's not the right brief, we can say, let's maybe take a step back, back and, then, and then revisit it. So, never be hesitant to question the brief. Air New Zealand, one of, when we did a lot of observations with users, um, I'll, I'll get back to that later, but we observed something interesting, which is that whenever people want to travel, 
as soon as they enter the plane, even before, control is completely taken out of them. They're not, they're just basically, they've been asked to just sit here, drink this, go to the bathroom there, and that's it, right? And that was an insight that we got over and over. So our goal for this project was to create a brand new experience for her in New Zealand with the intent of giving control back to users. So we went on and we, uh, we interviewed a lot of crew members, we interviewed a lot of users, and not only in the plane, by the way, because that's not where your journey starts. The journey starts way before, in the airport, even before that. So we went, we went up to the chain and uh, interviewing a lot of stakeholders, and we came up with uh, two completely new and radical innovations. So I'm going to show you a video. You will see that video summarize the work that we did together. And just a bit, a bit of a caveat to that is that we didn't make the video. You'll see why we didn't make the client did the video. So okay, so I'm just going to play this. And I'll see if that works. For three years, Air New Zealand has been working from a secret location in downtown Auckland to create the best long-haul flying experience the world has ever seen. The project is sworn to secrecy, its details known by only a few, until now. We started by flying the innovations company IDEO over from the US to gather insights about the way our customers travel. What we found was that some people think of a long-haul flight as a time to be social, and others would rather just keep to themselves. It had to work for everyone. We ran a series of seat boot camps to put local design talent through its paces. It was an awesome project to, uh, to kick off with, and one of those uh, real challenges that you uh, don't often get in your lifetime. Perhaps in, in simple terms, a bit like a sandpit, where you can just start from, from nothing and create whatever you want to do. Uh, no boundaries, no limits, um, and just tease out all the different concepts and ideas that everybody has. We tried some uh, things like people standing up, uh, sitting together, facing each other like they're around the kitchen table at home, um, even stacking people up on top of each other in bunks. The bunk bed was one of the really interesting concepts, but it put people in a position of being totally undignified in that sort of environment. To test our thinking, we built a full-size interior section of a Boeing 777-300. Actors and staff were brought in to stage a simulation flight that put the new seats, menus, and entertainment to the test. Three years have produced a unique and stunning new long-haul experience. The best in the world. But for us, this journey is by no means over. In fact, it's just begun. That gave you a kind of the, and, and we really did work like this with them, which was a fantastic project. So, working with clients together to get this done with pleasure. That's an important notion. When we do design, we want to do it with pleasure. That's something we want to be doing. Because if we have fun, it gets better and better. Okay, why was it relevant? Because it was a disruptive category, breaking better experience. Uh, it was co-designed with the Air New Zealand team, and the problem was solved. Control was given back to the passengers. So we, we, uh, we use the craft of design to stir the soul of your brand. Western Digital. I don't know if you know Western Digital. You, prob you might have one of, your, of their hard drives on your desk. Uh, they came to us a few years ago because Western Digital was not known from the, uh, the, the large um, consumer public industry. They were known for internal hard drive. And they say, hey, we don't have a brand. We're not known. Help us you know, figure it out. So we did a lot of user observations. And what I mean by user observation, by the way, at IDEO is go interview, go talk to people in their context. It's not behind a frosted glass. It's go and talk to them where they live, where they are, where they move. Because when we do this, I'll come back later to that point, this is an important one. When we do this, we see a lot more things than when we interview people in a room. Okay? There's fundamental notions, as, as you know about talking to people and, and users. There is what they say, 
right? They can say something to you, great, they can answer a great question, but there's what they think as well. And sometimes they don't, you know, they don't correlate. They can tell you something, but think something else. There is also what they feel. And they're going to tell you something, and maybe they feel something else. And there's also what they do, right? So in many instances, I have an example. I'm going to show you that. They're going to tell you something, and they're going to say, and they're going to do something completely different. Anyway, coming back to Western Digital, they say, okay, help us create something that is meaningful for that market. So we created a line of hard drive that was called My Book, a new brand called My Book. Now, what was interesting about My Book is that at the time, there were two phenomena. The first one is that hard drives were just black boxes. There was no meaning. People didn't care about them. They're like, what is it? I don't know what it is, right? So you create my book. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, now I'm building my library of digital content. And it's going to go on forever, right? Library of digital content. Yes, meaning, yes, get that, right? And that's what people wanted at the time. Building a brand, a meaningful brand, is important. So we created my book. And then since then, we created other, other products. We created the packaging. We also created a new line of products for them, and we created a software experience, right? Again, a brand being all of these elements connected. You guys know that, right? I'm sure you are, you're Apple users, some of you are, some of you are not. Apple understood before everybody else that a brand experience is connecting all the dots together in a consistent way. Well, that's what, that's what it is about, right? And when I say connected experience, that means it goes from your brand messaging to the radiuses that you're going to have here, from the macro level to the micro level. And that's really, really important because users know that now. We all know it, right? 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it wasn't the case. You could have a great product and a crappy brand, but it was OK. Now the, the, the notion of coherence in brands is absolutely fundamental. So, so, so brands need to understand that. So that's what we did for them. So in, 2000, in 2006, uh, Western Digital moved for the first external hard drive in the uh, in market. They were also distributed to the Apple Store. Wow, that's great. That's a big mark, right, for brand to be distributed in Apple Stores because it's really hard to get that. And they grew the US market um, uh, by 50%, uh, more than 50%, because it was connected, coherent. We designed branded experiences. Uh, I'm sure you guys probably know this. Actually, I don't know if you know this. Do you know Bank of America? Okay, Bank of America, one of the largest banks in the States, came to us because they wanted us to, they were kind of struggling to find new markets, new et cetera, et cetera, and they had a, a, a potential market in place for, for, for us. They said, go and observe these people. I said, well, great, no, let's do it. So we went on interviewing the, the target audience that they had suggested, and we found, obviously, something completely different, right? Well, in the States, people really struggle to save money. Okay, that's not news because I think that's everywhere the same thing. But what was very interesting here when we did observations is that when people write bills and checks, okay, if the uh, amount of the bill is let's say uh, fifty-nine dollar twenty, well, they would round it up to sixty dollars. Hmm, you guys should be puzzled by this because we don't do this in France. Never. Well, they did this. They do this in the States. Why do they do it? For two reasons. The first one is because it's simple. Ah, 59, 20. I'm not going to write this on my check. I'm just going to run it up to 60. 60, easy, right? And the second reason is because they could, the difference would be deducted from their next bill. So that was a way for them to save. There's a reasoning there. So we, we listened to that and to that insights, and we created a new service called Keep the Change. And Keep the Change functioned the same way, essentially. You have a credit card, ATM in this case, and when you go to do your shopping at Fnac or wherever, if the amount is 59.20, it rounds it up to 60, and the difference goes to a saving account. So you see the correlation between an insight to an opportunity to a new service. Very direct, very direct, and it can be very direct. For instance, it was that, because what we saw with users was perfectly clear. And there was a, what we call a pattern, very clear pattern among all the people that we talked to. So, uh, today it has helped 12 million new saving accounts, creating new sa 12 million saving accounts, and customers saved more than um, 3.1 billion. So that's the impact of design. That's the impact of design thinking. That's what we want. When we create something, we want to have either 
impact can be a, 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 an amount, can be a, a financial impact, but it, there's, there's so many measures of impact, which is also another thing about design thinking. For example, you could have a CEO of a company say, you know what, you help re revitalizing my company. We did this for, for a company called Eileen Fisher and other companies. So various measures of impact. This is one of them. Okay, we help organizations innovate. Ah, okay. Another good one. So there were a few years ago, I'm coming back to my example, this, you know, this fictitious company who come to us and say, hey, we have this great product. Design it and help us put it to market. So we designed a fantastic product, right? It's beautiful, it works well, it fits all the needs. They take it internally and then, but nothing happens. Hmm, that's puzzling. Well, yes, for a very simple reason. It's because companies want innovation, right? They want it really, really hard. The problem is they're not necessarily configured internally to make it happen. For, var for various reasons, obviously, because companies are extremely complex entities. The decision-making processes, the configuration internally are, are, are difficult and not even set up. I remember once I was working for a large American company and I, uh, I just go to their, to their design center and I enter a room and the room was filled with projects, filled. And I was, they, they didn't know what to do with it. That's exactly why we now help companies innovate. What that means is that we help them structure themselves internally so that they can incubate innovation and they can put it to market. This is what we did with the gym. Uh, Procter & Gamble asked us to essentially think about that. Hey, we want, a, we want an innovation center. Help us understand what it means, how we can create it, what are going to be the, the organization ramification that we need to put in place to make it happen. It's called the gym now. And they do exactly that. They incubate and put to market. So what, when we did design this, this is not only just the gym, the fun word, right? It's really just reconfiguring the organization so that they can actually make it, make it happen. So you see now, you start, you start seeing where, we, where IDEO has an impact from the very beginning of framing a brief from nothing to taking to new opportunities to taking to market through organizational change. So basically we can act at the moment, uh, on pretty much every level of a company where there's a need, right? Now, with organization, it's, it's always tricky because organizations are made with people and because they're, they might be willing to do this, they might be willing to say, hey, wait, we want innovation, we want innovation. The problem is that they're social entities um, that are difficult to move sometimes, right? So what we do when we do organizational change, we, don't, we just don't change the org chart and we say, okay, now you have a, a chief innovation officer because that just doesn't work, right? This is not by changing your org chart that you change your organization. We start with projects. We bring projects because that, the projects are the catalyzers for innovation, right? Theory in companies doesn't work. You want to have very clear briefs and to, to make the change happen. Now, good? Does it make sense? Okay, I'll carry on. I'm almost done, actually, I think, with the kind of conversation. Huh? For Fortune 500 to start up. So, uh, you saw Procter & Gamble, a lot of people, huge budgets. But, but at IDEO, we love working with startups. Why? Just because it's, there is aspects of startups that are, at the moment, in Silicon Valley, but I would say elsewhere in the world, right? Uh, the nimbleness, the desire to go to market really quickly. The culture the emerging culture that is really interesting for us. Now, I mentioned the notion of nimbleness with IDEO. This is really important, right? If you're not nimble in the culture of innovation and in the world right now, this is gonna be very difficult. That's why a lot of companies, even large companies, want to copy the model of start startups because they're more nimble. And their biggest problem is not necessarily their you know, the content that they have, the problem is the culture. Bon alors, je vais vous, donc vous montrer quelques exemples de start -up. Et puis après, on discutera. Euh, Kobo. Vous connaissez peut-être Kobo parce qu'ils sont, ils sont, ils sont vendus à la FNAC. Kobo, donc on a, on a fait leur, leur, leur design, leur design, ce qu'on appelle design language. I'm speaking French now. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Seriously. I'm completely jet lagged, by the way. I just, I just come in, so bear with me here. So, <laughs> so they came because there was, uh, they wanted us to redesign the, to do the design language of their new ebook reader and, and say, okay, well, we'll do it, no problem. And it was a fairly short project, but as you can see, 
the device, the front of the, it's a very simple device, right? An ebook reader, very simple on the front because when you read your books, you don't want to have any noise around it. And the back, there's a quilted pattern, right? You see that. This is their brand. This is Kobo's brand. And that's kind of surprising because Kobo has a whole philosophy around uh, their, their reading life, um, which is essentially their business model. But when Kobo came and I talked to the CEO and said, you know what, Blaise, this pat quilted pattern there is our brand. I'm like, really? Why? Well, because when people read with a Kobo reader, there's the tactile feedback in the back. I'm like, that's just a detail, right? No, as a matter of fact, every element of the device is part of the experience that people really value. So you can have a great business model, but if the business model is not complemented by details such as this one that are very emotional, right, that really resonates, then they, it's, it's gonna work, but it's not gonna necessarily complement it. So the quilted pattern of Kobo. So we designed this project, and then um, right after, it was purchased actually in 2012 by uh, Japanese investors, for 315 million cash. Well, that's pretty good, right, for a startup? Just getting you know, bought out by uh, Japanese investors. And of course, they got a, we got a, several awards. But I think this is, this is the beauty of, again, nimbleness, working with understanding the functional and emotional aspect of an offering. It is not only a, so again, huh? well, in this case, the technology was more software technology. But the convergence of the three, the three circles that you saw there, is exactly represented in that. And again, pretty short and, and, and sweet impact. Now obviously, the, uh, it's, it's an ongoing conversation and evolution. Faraday. Hmm. So there's another thing that we love doing at IDEO, is that when there's, there are designers who have ideas, who want to do something, we just say, hey, great, do it. You know, do it, and then uh, we'll see what happens. So Adam and Adam, one Adam was an engineer, the other one was a designer wanted to do this uh, competition called the Oregon Manifest. It was about building a bike, simple. I said, okay, why not, huh? So they did it on their own time, at night. They just did the competition. They, they uh, partnered with a frame manufacturer called uh, Rock, uh, Rock Lobster here. And then for weeks, they just did this, and, and they won the competition. And we let them do it. Why? As I said earlier, because IDEO is fostering passions, okay? If, if designers don't love their job at IDEO, it just doesn't work. We don't, it, so for them to love their work is obviously having great clients, but it's also when you have an idea, when you have something you want to do, do it, okay? We're not going to say no. If these guys had told me, hey, I want to do this, and I would have said no, it, that, that just didn't work. I mean, the equation just doesn't even work for me. So I say, yeah, we said yes. We're going to facilitate that, take your time, use our shop, and just do it. So they won the competition, which was great, right? So the idea was to redesign one of these utility, old utility bikes, and that's what they created. Now, um, it, it is an electric bike, by the way. Mm. I don't see much of it because the batteries are in the tubes. They basically created their own algorithm to make it work, and, and from scratch. And it's a beautiful object, right? Because it has, it takes reminiscence in the old bike, but really projected into the future. So, idea is, is not top-down, as we say. It is not, hey, here's the CEO with a big vision, and then it's going to cascade it to everyone. That's just not the way we operate. We operate from on, on all levels. We uh, also have a, a branch of IDEO that is called .org, and we, uh, we help nonprofit organizations. And the .org was born out of someone at IDEO who just wanted to do humanitarian work or do things, other things that IDEO was not doing in their portfolio. So we did an IDEO.org because it was important. And now we are much involved in this, and, and we're continuing flourishing it. We did the same thing for sustainability. Sustainability, at IDEO, was, was not a decision from you know, Tim Brown, our CEO, just to say, go do you know, sustainability. That's just something that we wanted to do. And one person in particular said, it really matters to me. OK, great. That, that's fantastic, because it matters to all of us. And we let them evolve that, right? So the notion of understanding that a company, whether it's a large company or, or startups, a company like IDEO, it's, it's this transversality that happens. It's this migration that happens. Where we leave, my role is to leave space for opportunities to happen, for people to express themselves. That's really important. Leadership at IDEO is not just to say, I'm the leader, I'm gonna tell you what to do. It's just to let, it's like a garden, you let flourish. Let all these flowers to grow. And sometimes, you know, sometimes some, some grows and sometimes they don't. But that's, that always happens. That's the, the risk taking. So um, 
Lars Enrich. Hack Forward. Do you guys know Hack Forward, actually? I'm curious. You do? Okay. So Lars came to us because he had this, this, this notion. I mean, obviously, he's you know, the founder of Zing, of Zing, so you probably know him. But um, he wanted to create a, a tech incubator in Germany. Actually, that would apply to all Europe. And he came to us for that. He said, hey, help us. I don't have much, really. I just have an idea. So, okay, well, we're going to help you. So we designed basically the whole, the whole structure for, for this incubator. And it was really geared towards the aspect, uh, the geek aspect, right? So, so people, uh, technologists, young entrepreneurs, who just want to do technology. That's all they want to do, but they have a great idea. And right now in Europe, there's not really a, gr a ground for that, right? If you have a great idea and you want to go, you want to build your company, this is, I mean, you guys know better than anyone else, that landscape. So what we did is helping him kind of formulate what the offering would be for this incubator. And there were a few grand, grand principles. First of, first of all, is we have, what we've noticed, so we went through the innovation process, and what we've noticed is that, um, it, you know, if I love technology, sometimes I just want to do technology and help me do what I do best. Why do I need to learn all this business stuff right now in super depth when right now I just need to focus on that? So what we did is we helped these geeks to focus on their ID while we, are, we were having, we were building a company of serial entrepreneurs, right? We we're helping them. So that's where Hack Forward was born out of. And I'm gonna show you a short video. And also the curriculum, the engagement process. Now, if you wanna get VC funding or whatever, this is a complete nightmare. It's just, it's super difficult. You have to go through rounds and rounds and rounds. And what we did here is that to adhere to that, to build your business plan, we want to simplify everything. So the no one of the notions that we had developed there was the notion of complete transparency. Be transparent to everything you're going to do there. And that's something that we see actually happening more and more with companies. So let me show you that video. I'll give you a better understanding of what Hack Forward is about. Here we go. Cool stuff. Pushing what's possible. Breaking new ground. Imagining the future. Maybe you work a day job in Paris, but spend your nights coding a pet project. Come to us through our referrer network with a clickable idea, and perhaps even the co-founder or two who helped you build it. Forget PowerPoint and pie charts. We'd rather understand why you believe the world needs it. If we agree your product shows potential, even if there's plenty yet to resolve, we'll roughly match your current salary for one year. So you can spend that time focused entirely on making it something great. And it doesn't matter where you're based in Europe. At most, you're two hours away by plane or seconds away by email. Mm. Make sense? You should go and check it out. Hack forward. Okay, so this shows you the kind of the, 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 the diversity of startup we, we work with, right? Hardware startups, software startups, and now we are even working with a company called Flextronics, um, which you probably know they produce a lot of things, and we do hardware, software for them. We helped, you know, companies and startup incubate. Okay, so I think for startups, the challenge, one of the challenges is bringing all this perspective together, right? So I'm, I have a few, few things that I want to work, work you through. With spe especially with regard to startup. Now, what we love to advocate for startups is this notion of design-driven strategy, right? Is, and this, this is gonna sound familiar because that's what we talked about before, is that when you, when you think about the projection of your company, think about how you're gonna build it, but think about how you're gonna integrate, as you see here, this notion of you know, thinking, building, thinking, building, thinking, building, these waves. Don't just think about thinking. And again, I mean, many of you already know that, right? This is, this is not rocket science, but just understanding that strategy, a design-driven strategy implies in its construct the build part. Be curious. Ah, yes, that's another part. I was talking to you earlier about this uh, understanding how people, the art of human factor, observing people, so be curious is really important, right? Because if you want to go in different parts, this is a short video of a person that we interviewed in the context of a beauty project. 
So beauty project, in this case, we went and are observing different types of people, different profiles, what we call extreme users on the project. Why? Because these extreme users inform us, can inspire us, right? If you just study the middle, the middle ground, you're not gonna necessarily be very inspired, but if you go like fully extreme, you're gonna learn something. So for this beauty project, we went on oh, oh, interviewing this person in this house. So we start talking to the person and says, so uh, what do you think about beauty products? Ah, oh, I'm a simple type of guy. I don't use anything. Nah, you know, basics, nothing. And then the, uh, the person who was interviewing just sees something next to the sofa, and it's this uh, massage, foot massage device. So she asks him, what is this thing here? Oh, well, you know, it's, it's, you know, occasionally I like to do, you know, take care of my feet and, you know, a little foot massage. Well, yeah, of course. Now, here's the thing. If we hadn't posed that question about these little treatments that he liked to have, Right? We would have stu been stuck on this, I don't know, I'm a simple type of guy, I don't use it. We wouldn't have gotten anything out of this interview. What's great here is that the observer, the person who was asking the question, was able to just see what was next to it and use that device as a probe for conversation. Therefore, getting really, really rich around the content. So that's why the notion of being curious is exactly that. Right? When you observe people in their context, try to see outside of what's in front of you. Look around, right? There might be something that you'll discover that we'll, that we'll use as a prompt for conversation. And it happens all the time. When I say this is the art observation, it's really, it really is an art. So we have, at IDEO, we have what we call human factors. These are people who are either a sociologist, ethnologist, psychologist, but everybody is able, should have the basics of understanding how people observe, right? And so that's something, it, I would encourage every, everyone in this room to observe and continuously be curious. Curious doesn't belong to kids. Curiosity doesn't belong to kids. Curiosity belongs to everyone, right? To, to every designer, every engineer, every entrepreneur, because that's part of the way we do things. Uh, meaning through principles. Again, now, I want to show you another short clip. At IDEO, we, we go, we observe people, and then we come back in our room. And then we have to establish a foundation because I don't know if you know, but we have tons of post-its. Post post-its is kind of our, we have a, a philosophy, a post-itology philosophy. I'm not going to give you a lesson tonight, but that's, we, we clearly have a, uh, something about post-its, an addiction to post-its, I would say. But when we come from observation, there's tons of insights, and it's about making sense of this. And this making sense of it is part of our process and establishing what we call design principles and frameworks, which is kind of the more abstract part of things, but that's, that's, uh, that, that's part of the process. So it's called a synthesis process. And that happens like this. This is three days. The team basically took a camera, put it in their project space, and uh, they were basically synthesizing all the information that they got, all the interviews, all the pictures, all the quotes. They put it on the wall. And then you see that there's the core team member who lives together for the duration of the project, and the other people who gravitate towards when, when needed. So it's pretty intense. And that synthesis process can happen from three days to two weeks, to three weeks. It really depends how vast the uh, research is. But what you see here is that post-its actually enable you to be super, super nimble. Again, nimble and fast. See, they change constantly. They adapt, they, do, they create new opportunities, they synthesize, they bring it again and again. I mean, we get pretty dizzy afterwards, so I'll just stop it after a minute. But I'll give you, kind of give you a sense of this notion of postitology. Okay, start early and wrong. I mentioned that fail. Fail early. Now, I know it's something very difficult in France. The notion of failure. We don't want to fail, right? Don't, don't even mention it. Well, yes, do it now. Tomorrow start and start failing. Uh, of course, uh, you want to succeed. But the idea of failing early is to succeed later. And I was telling you, that's what prototyping is. But that's also, that's a, that's a process, but that's also a mentality. In particularly, I think in Silicon Valley, what I've always found interesting is that people just don't hesitate. They're gonna take risks, they're gonna fall, they're gonna get back again. And that's okay, that's part of the culture. There's nothing wrong with it. You're not gonna have a name attached to your head if you fail. As a matter of fact, that's part of building your curriculum. Oh, you know, I have many friends who failed like three, four startups. 
that's okay. You know, they've built experience, and now they're going to do another one. That's the spirit of entrepreneurship that is really, really interesting. And I know it's, it's, we, we know it starts happening in France, which is great, thanks to you guys, right? Um, but it's a, it, it's a mental change. It is something that says it's okay to fail. And you know what? If we fail earlier, that's what I was telling you earlier, right? Of course, if you fail after millions of you know, dollars or euros, yeah, that's a pretty steep uh, you know, curve. But, but if you failed because you, you did a, a, a paper mock-up, that's okay, right? There's not too much pressure. So failing means start an earlier, put them earlier, and then so that you have less, less pressure. Because ultimately, there's another really important factor in design thinking. Pressure. Pressure. Lots of companies have pressure. Well, what we do in everything that you've seen is relieving that pressure. Right? Of course, it's inevitable. You're always going to have pressure. But if you do it in a way that's engaging, that's enthusiastic, that you bring the right people in that with the right process, it's a lot easier. Okay? Uh, exploring options. I'm going to pass you know, quickly on this one, but uh, again, uh, it's very, uh, when, you start, when you have a startup, usually you have an idea, you have a vision, right? And that vision, it's great. You want to carry it through, right? From beginning to end. Unfortunately, while well, the market changes, condition changes, maybe six months later, another product will come that exactly the same that you had. So you have to be able to kind of shift gears and listen and change and reorient your vision as the market evolves, or as your offering evolves, or uh, other, other conditions evolve. And again, that's easy to say, right? Yeah, okay, I know I need to need more. Well, the fact is that more and more, this is a requirement, because volatility of the market and ch market changes happen more and more. Uh, not only that, but you see uh, startups who want to go to market quicker, but also big, large companies want to get to market more quicker. So that, that landscape is completely changing. So, so exploring options and constantly gathering feedback. Right? Feedback. Okay, I have an ID. Share idea. I have friends, they just come and bring, bring ideas and say, okay, look at this. Oh, okay, look at this. Well, that's crap, right? But the fact is that feedback is part of the process as well. Don't be afraid of just exposing people of your idea. Because a lot of people say, oh, that's my idea. I'm not going to talk to anyone about this. This is my idea. Well, that's not exactly the case anymore. Your idea, you know what? Someone else had it. And someone else had it as well. So that's why this process, also mentalities are exchanging on that level. Sharing, getting feedback, sharing, it's only going to get better. You're not going to lose your IP, you're not going to lose your integrity, you're not going to lose anything. Open up. And that's what, for, as, as Heidi was mentioning, we have more and more clients who actually want to get that. Uh, shift focus, I mentioned that. Uh, this is related to, the, to, to this aspect of, okay, now you're going really, 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 really deep on one aspect of the startup, of the, of the project. <laughs> Zoom out really quickly. Look at the big picture. Zooming in, zooming out, zooming in, zooming out. Systemic, that's a completely systemic approach. That's also a behavior, right? I'm here and I'm just zooming out to see the big picture. And collaboration, we, uh, we I mentioned that, so I'm not gonna dwell too much on this one. Prototyping in context, right? So we have this notion that we call sacrificial concepts. I really don't like the word sacrificial concept, but it can work. So sometimes we start a project and we create a bunch of things, a bunch of concepts, whether it's software, hardware, right? And we show it to people at an early stage. Um, that's one way, what we call sacrificial, because people can say, boo, that's really bad. You know, do it again. And that's okay, I think that's part of it. Again, in design, there's no ego. I have my design, I can trash it the next minute, it's okay. Because it's gonna evolve no matter what. That's, again, this very notion of attachment, not being attached to an ID at any given time. Because your ID is gonna change. Oh, this is a good one. Um, prototyping interaction, we created a, we have, a, we have a, a studio at IDEO, it's called a toy lab. What they do all day long, they invent toys. Uh, it's great. So they came up with this app uh, for Sesame Street, Elmo's Monster Maker. So they prototyped, and very rough, really, really rough, look, look at this. Prototyping. Look. 
that was it, right? Rough prototyping, but it worked. It's easy, just cut a piece of paper and start playing this thing. Don't need to code hundreds of lines, just try. Try short interactions and, and see what happens. Um, hybrid, really quickly, we, I was talking about observe several types of, of, uh, of observations. There's what we call qualitative and there's the quantitative observations. And for a very long time at IDEO, we were mostly on the qualitative side and now I think we're integrating more the, qu the quantitative. So alternating and knowing when to alternate, quantitative and qualitative is also really important. And building your network, that's a, a big one. Because, and that's why that's we're all here, I guess. <laughs> because you want to start building your network. And that's something that I, is really great in Silicon Valley, particularly, because the, the network is, is huge. But remember that quote that they gave about David Kelly wanting to work with his friends? That's where it starts. Building a network of people who are going to help you grow, right? Whether they're mentors, or whether they're friends, or whether they're whoever, colleagues, that the, the, the power of, the, of a network is just so strong that, again, we don't want to think in isolation anymore. This is completely, that model is completely obsolete. So, so thinking about building a network constantly is important. And then finally, I'm just going to leave it that, be optimistic. Um, at IDEO, we'll have to play, and that's one of the projects, that's one of the concept projects uh, that we did, how to entertain a cat. Um, that's part of it, right? Be optimistic. But again, right? That's, that, that's key. Because we go, when, when we do innovation, it goes, it's great, and then sometimes, oh, it's really terrible, and it's growing. But having that quality is really, really fundamental. Being optimistic and keeping that, right? Um, and don't take yourself too seriously. That's very, that's very, very true, at least for us. I don't know if, if, if it's the, uh, and I'm, I'm, I think it's Silicon Valley as well. Most importantly, have fun, because that's what innovation is. If it's, if it's painful, it's not worth it. You know, we might as well have fun with innovation. So wrapping up, always have a solid business model hypothesis. We talked about this. Encourage empathy and test your assumptions. We talked about that. Prototyping as early as possible. Keep it simple. Don't build an entire fortress. Um, start with a one brick or a stool. Uh, surround yourself with great people and be optimistic. Okay. Now we're going to be able to talk. I'm done. I think I'm done.